Uh, hello everyone. It's one o'clock, so we're going to start. One o'clock in the UK anyway. Um, welcome to the LSE for today's hybrid event. So welcome to everyone in person and welcome to everyone online. This is part of the LSE Festival, People and Change. It's taking place from Monday the 12th, which I think was yesterday, through to Saturday the 17th, exploring how does change affect people and how do people affect change. My name is Professor Elizabeth Robinson. I'm director of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at LSE. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really, really delighted to um, be welcoming our, our four speakers today. We have um, Dr. Liam Bison McGrath there, um, Chris Skidmore, uh, Ray Newton Smith, and Dr. Anna Valero. And so I'd like to introduce um, to people here and um, online. So if I just give you a very brief, um, very, very brief summary of, of, of each of our guests. So Liam F. Bison McGrath, he's assistant professor in international social and policy public policy, can't get my P's the right way around, um, in Department of Social Policy here at LSE. Um, they're also the organizer of EPG Online, uh, which is an online seminar series covering environmental politics and governance. Uh, Liam's research primarily focuses on the political economy of climate change, and Liam uses experimental research designs and machine learning. Um, some of their current focus uh, projects is on the impact of energy insecurity on climate, environment, and social policy preferences, how economic insecurity and employment risks affecting environmental concern, and uh, public support for carbon pricing schemes. So thank you, Liam. Welcome. Uh, Chris Skidmore, just to my right, has been MP for Kingswood. That's somewhere near Bristol Bath area. There we go. Um, since 2010, he served in five government departments between 2015 and 2020. Some of those positions include Minister of State for Universities, Science, Research and Innovation twice. That's um, particularly relevant for us. Uh, between 2018 and 2020. In 2019, he was appointed Minister of State for Energy and Clean Growth, um, attending Cabinet. And during that time, he signed the UK's commitment to net zero by 2050 into law, really important that, and helped secure the UK presidency of COP26, which was in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, most recently, Chris has served as the chair of the government's independent net zero review. And he published a 340-page three, mm -hmm. um, Mission Zero report, I hope we've read it all, in January 2023. He's currently chair of the All-Party Group on the Environment and also a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And just this morning, actually, we heard that you are, have just been appointed professor in practice yes. at the yeah. University of Bath to um, boost their work on sustainability and climate research. So that's awesome to hear, too. Uh, Rain. Uh, Rain Newton Smith is Director General of the Confederation of British Industry, CBI. Uh, before Rain took up the role, she was Managing Director of Strategy and Policy, Sustainability and ESQ at Barclays. Yep, it's a long one. Um, <laughs> previously um, Chief Economist at CBI and representing British businesses, uh, focusing on the UK economic outlook and climate change. Uh, Rain has also worked as head of emerging markets at Oxford Economics, uh, where she managed a large team of economists and was lead expert on China. Earlier, Rain led teams of the Bank of England, including the International Forecast Team for Monetary Policy Committee, and a team with responsibility for developing a risk assessment framework for the UK financial system. Um, Anna Valero, uh, as another colleague, is a distinguished policy fellow at LSE's Centre for Economic Performance, CEP. We like our acronyms. I'm your deputy director of the programme on Innovation and Diffusion, that's POID, um, and an associate of the Grantham Research Institute, where I work. Uh, Anna's research is focused on the drivers of productivity and innovation and realising opportunities for sustainable and inclusive growth in the net zero transition. And as a member of the uh, steering group of the Resolution Foundation CEP Economy 2030 inquiry, funded by the Nuffield Foundation. She's, got, um, she's held a number of advisory roles uh, for the UK government and is currently a member of the Economic Advisory Council, which advises the Chancellor of the Exchequer on economic policy to help grow the economy and the Green Jobs Delivery Group. So this is just an awesome um, uh, group of experts who are going to talk to us today. And today, um, for the next hour, or 55 minutes now, we're going to be exploring how can we ensure that the net zero transition is an inclusive one so that crucial public support can be maintained and built. So for those of you who are tweeting in the audience, the hashtags for today's event is hashtag LSE Festival. Obviously, our phone's on silent, please, so we don't disrupt the event. Uh, the event is being recorded, and um, 
hopefully, because you never know if there are going to be technical difficulties, but assuming no technical difficulties, it will be made available as a podcast at some point after this. So each speaker has 10 minutes to talk, and then there's going to be a chance for you to put your questions to um, Dr. Leanne Beiser McGrath, Chris Skidmore, Ray Newton Smith, and Dr. Anna Valero. Uh, for the online audience, you can commit your, uh, submit your questions via the Q&A feature, please. And um, please include your name and affiliation if you can. And uh, for those of you in the theatre, I'll let you know when we open the floor for questions. Please raise your hands, wait for stewards. I'll pick a selection of questions and cluster them at a time. And we're going to try and have a range of questions from both online audience and um, in-person audience. So uh, without um, further ado, as they say, um, I think we're going to start with Liam. Originally, I thought the running order was oh, with Chris. But no, we're uh, maybe we're going to start with Chris. <laughs> Isn't that awful? I've, have I left my running order behind? Oh, you're so right. We're going to start with, uh, we're going to start with Chris. I'm so sorry, Chris. So, well, uh, thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you all for attending uh, today. Um, it's often the case, I think, when it comes to looking at sustainability and climate action, we all want to go further, you know, faster, and we always focus on what more needs to be done. But actually, if you asked me four years ago uh, this month, uh, when I had the opportunity of signing the UK's uh, commitment to net zero into law back in June 2019, that 48 months on, we'd have 90% of the world's GDP, 80% of all countries, 40% of all international companies signed up to a net zero target of some form. I, I simply wouldn't have believed you. You know, the pace of global change has been immense. And one of the core narratives of the Mission Zero Review that Elizabeth mentioned that I, I published in January was not just that sort of net zero is here to stay. This is the new economic reality of the 21st century and the economic opportunity of the 21st century, we so wish to seize it. The reality is, is that the not zero path of inaction, of not taking that additional steps needed towards investment, will lead to degrowth, to economic destabilization in the UK. Investment now can go elsewhere. We've seen that with other countries such as the United States very firmly now demonstrate that every second job will be a green job uh, as part of the uh, energy transition. So the risk for the UK is not net zero, it is, it is not zero. And I wanted to make that a key part of the uh, net zero review, demonstrating to government that net zero is not just an environmental uh, challenge, you know, it's an economic one uh, also. But with that and the pace of change, it's not just that we're, the fact that we're in a new global net zero race where the, the UK gets left behind, other countries willing to go further faster, but also there are other sort of communities, other industries through no fault for their own, having been historically high carbon emitters, that can also potentially get left behind. And so in the net zero review, I set out a process by which I wasn't reviewing net zero as such, but how to put guardrails around some of the policies uh, around delivery of net zero. Because net zero, as you all know, is not about 2050. It's about delivering on some key commitments for 2030, ensuring the UK can meet its climate commitments, its national determined contributions of 68% emissions reduction. And with that, we have the electric vehicle mandate, we've got the uh, boiler mandate, so no new gas boilers from 2035. We've got the heat pump target, 600,000 heat pumps from 2035. And these are important milestones from a perspective of a politician. We've got to make sure we don't overpromise and <coughs> deliver. We've got to be able to say now what needs to be delivered in terms of the infrastructure requirements. You know, when it comes to renewable energy, a key issue is obviously delays on the grid. Do we have the capacity, the capability in place? Every single round table I organized as part of the Zero review skills and people came up because you know we can focus on the technologies that are needed to deliver net zero but unless we have those engineers those technicians the workforce in place to be able to deliver the transition it's not going to happen but at the same time the workforces that exist at the moment in the UK also need to be taken with us and I look at net zero as being a sort of tightrope it's the very least that we can do in order to decarbonize, to meet our 1.5 degree sort of uh, target set by the UN, at the same time as deliver economic growth. And with that, a recognition that we are not going to destabilize communities that might be left behind as part of the transition. And in the net zero review, I 
created these six pillars around how do we put guardrails on, on the policy. So one of them was net zero in the economy. And it's important, I think, to recognize within the economic challenge that whose opportunity is this? If we see net zero simply as an opportunity for multinational companies in the city of London to make a lot of money, then we would have failed. Ultimately, we've got to be able to recognize that this is a, a, a 80% of all businesses in the UK are SMEs. They don't necessarily have the capability or the capacity at the moment to see how they're going to meet net zero. They don't have the information, the data, the tools available to do so either. So the role of government in able to support those smaller organisations and companies is absolutely vital because we've got to, as a climate community, have the social licence to practice. I think it's really important to demonstrate to people that the change isn't the top-down imposition being forced on them through mandates, through taxation, because the risk is over a 28-year process. You know, every action has a reaction. And we've seen that you know, in the United States with potential action now being taken against ESG investing in certain states. I don't want a similar situation to emerge in the UK where net zero becomes part of a new culture war. I set up a net zero support group uh, in Parliament to counter some of the issues around disinformation and misinformation being peddled by certain detractors who've turned against net zero. And the opposition to net zero is no longer the science is unclear around uh, climate change. We've moved on now to, well, are we going too far too fast? You know, the new climate delayers are the new climate deniers, and they have an agenda which is to peddle fear, to peddle uncertainty about the nature of the transition. And what's really important is that we work to communicate both as policymakers and politicians and academics the rationale of why we're doing this. So coming out and saying net zero is going to make us warmer, richer, not colder and poorer, it's going to deliver better health outcomes, co-benefits, is really important to effectively selling net zero, uh, making sure that you can continue to press of why we are doing what we're doing, and that even if there wasn't a climate crisis, which there clearly is, we should be doing net zero for the economic opportunity it presents local communities. A key part of the net zero review was not just identifying those hard to abate industries, providing additional support for energy intensive industries, agriculture, Areas where you know, net zero has barely touched the sides, that we need to focus on how they can demonstrate that the change will benefit them for the future. Also, we need to focus on how we can deliver net zero more effectively at a regional level. I often say that half of all decisions around net zero set up by the, the Committee on Climate Change are not for government to take. We need that whole of society approach to net zero. And to do that, we've got to make more people authors of their own net zero stories and masters of their own net zero destiny. So ensuring that local government, which is more trusted than politicians like myself in Westminster, is able to have the tools and the capacity to set out the roadmaps what it can mean locally is really important. With that, regional governments, regional mayors, they're desperate to have more powers. They're desperate to go further faster. Many cities across the UK, Glasgow, Manchester, want to do net zero before 2030. So giving local communities also the powers is absolutely vital. And then finally, the issue around households and the individual is a separate pillar in the net zero review. And demonstrating that this change is not a unique one is really important. We've been here before, whether it was a transition to electricity, whether it was a transition from fireplaces to gas boilers in the 1950s, 1960s, you know, whether it's a transition towards digital technologies, towards the internet, you know, moving your Netflix collection, sorry, your DVD collection to Netflix. You know, we have transitions around us all of the time. You know, it is part of facing the future. And delivering on net zero is, is nothing different to that. We've got to be able to demonstrate, however, the financial opportunity at a household level for why individuals can make the change and see the benefit economically as well as uh, environmentally. Uh, and with that, uh, those are my opening words. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. That's, that was really fantastic. Um, so I'm um, getting my order right now. <laughs> next is, our next speaker is um, Rain Newton-Smith. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank you for having me. It, it's great to, to be here. And thanks, all of you, for joining online uh, as well. Uh, I have to say, I'm sure there are many things that are challenging about being a student uh, at, at the moment. But uh, returning to LSE, I have to say, these buildings are lovely. And, and the technology certainly uh, wasn't here when I was a, a student. Um, uh, and it gives us a sense, I think, of, of the pace of change as, as well. Uh, picking up more what Chris was saying, that we do need to see across 
uh, our society to, to move towards net zero. And I couldn't agree more that, you know, this isn't about 2050, this is about what we do now, what happens over the next uh, five to, to, ten, to 10 years, making sure we're fir firmly on that trajectory by 2030 is absolutely uh, critical. And it won't happen unless we have sectors uh, and organisations working across the whole economy. So households, business, government, we all need to uh, pull together to, to make this happen. Um, and as, as Chris was saying, and I think we all, you know, sometimes we focus on the costs of transition, but don't think about uh, the costs of not acting um, and of being too slow uh, to decarbonise, you know, across um, sectors. And look at, at the CBI speaking for businesses across regions, across sectors, uh, across nations, and, and indeed size of business uh, in the UK. We are lucky and fortunate in the UK that there is a big consensus in the business community about, uh, you know, it may be being more challenged recently, but there is, is a really strong consensus and that puts us apart from some of the other G7 uh, countries and we need to make the most of that. Uh, and whether it's thinking about us as an organisation and, and how we supported the, the legislation to get uh, net zero into law uh, four years ago or, or how we worked with businesses um, uh, you know, as part of the UN's accelerator uh, to get more and more businesses signed up to, to uh, net zero. And you know, we're fortunate in the UK that over 70% of the FTSE 100 uh, companies have signed up to, to net zero. Um, but we know that actually it can't be individual companies, it can't be individual uh, people acting alone that will make this change happen. It, it's, hu it's a hugely complex uh, issue, so we all need to get behind it. So, and, and to my mind, and I am an optimist by nature, and I think also in terms of what motivates people, it's understanding the opportunity, and, and that is certainly where business leaders are, is seeing the opportunity there is for the UK on how we lead uh, the world. We certainly have done that, even from, uh, you know, not just the review that, that Chris has done, but also looking at, you know, adopting net zero into law, the UK Committee on Climate Change. We have led on some of the, the governance uh, associated with this, and we need to make the most of that opportunity. But I think when we're talking to people and households trying to set out where the opportunities are, it is absolutely about jobs and, and thinking about how we can transform our economy, but that has to happen in a way that's inclusive to communities uh, around the UK. And we know there's huge opportunities in the transition, but we have to do it right. So it you know, can support up to uh, half a million jobs by, by 2030 if we get the scale of private sector investment that we know we need to see uh, in net zero uh, technologies. Um, and whether it's thinking about you know, the supply chain for electric vehicles in the northeast of, of England or thinking about the opportunities in Yorkshire and Humber around how we uh, decarbonise uh, heavy industries, uh, the UK has the opportunity uh, to lead the world. So we need to show uh, that that can happen uh, by uh, helping people develop the skills of the future. We're, we're better to, to speak about that than, than in a university uh, setting. Secondly, I, I think we also, we often focus uh, primarily when we're thinking about energy, around energy supply, where does our energy come from, and that is a key part of it. You know, we need, we, the UK has been hugely successful on uh, making sure that our energy comes from renewable sources. Yes, we have further to go on that, of course we do. Uh, but actually, the bit where we need to think more about is energy demand and how we all use energy, and there are uh, there are also benefits for households from that through uh, reduced uh, energy bills and, and uh, you know, the cheapest energy we, we can get, and I say this at a period where we are going through a cost of living crisis, some of which is obviously driven by uh, really high uh, energy costs, but the cheapest energy is the energy that we don't use. So I hope any of you at home, I hope you shut your curtains before you left. Uh, because it's not just about how we heat our homes, it's how we keep them cool as we see uh, more warming. And there are simple things we can do which help uh, preserve energy and improve energy efficiency. And that's something that we've worked on thinking about how we help people through that transition. And that's thinking about our homes, right? How our homes are, are heated, 
uh, how we make sure that we are uh, providing mortgages which make it easy for households to retrofit their homes. So many of our buildings, uh, this is a newer one, but across the street there are some beautiful old buildings and how we make those more energy efficient is a huge challenge for the UK. But if we do it right, there's so much of that technology we can share risk with the rest of, of the world. Um, uh, and so we can, you know, that can come through lower household bills, but we also need to look at the regulation that sits alongside uh, energy and think about the relative price of, of electricity versus gas. And that's something that uh, Chris touched on in, in his review and, and something that's really important. Uh, I'm proud to be one of the owners of, of one, one small effort in the uh, air source heat pumps uh, in, in heating homes. So, yeah, but obviously you can speak to the relatively high price of electricity versus gas in, in home heats. But there, there are things we can do around policy to, to help drive the investment we need. But finally, around households and, and people, I think it's, it's, it's literally the air around us. It's thinking about the co-benefits uh, that can come from the transition uh, to net zero. And that is absolutely thinking about um, you know, reducing energy demand and energy supply, but all the benefits we have from cleaner air as part of the, the transition. And obviously London uh, has been uh, leading the charge on this. Walking to the building, I could see the uh, banners around a clean air day. Uh, and it's something that we have looked into as well, thinking about the economic analysis uh, that can demonstrate some of the benefits from clean air. Uh, and we worked at CBI Economics on showing that we can have, um, we can have contribute 1.6 billion to our economy per year if we can improve our overall standards around air quality to the WHO uh, standards. And really that comes from the fact that that means we all live longer, healthier lives, have fewer sick days owing to asthma or, or caring responsibilities uh, for those who suffer from asthma and, and other conditions. And we saw how important that is uh, to our wider economy uh, through the pandemic and, and beyond. But it's also thinking around biodiversity. And I, uh, the UK has also led the world in thinking about the economics of, of biodiversity. And what we're seeing now within businesses is starting to think about the problem of, of climate change and biodiversity loss and bringing those issues together and thinking about what are the policies we need, what do we need to do uh, in businesses to address that. So look, I think there are so many areas where the UK can really be leading on this. We've managed to do it uh, in the past, but it's only going to come from us working uh, across sectors, across regions, uh, from business, government and, and households, and all of us as individuals uh, pulling in, in the same direction. We know we don't have a moment uh, to lose, and it's these sort of discussions that really help us uh, to get firmly on, on that path by 2030. Thanks so much. This is great. Um, two, two really interesting um, talks so far from our external speakers. Really, um, uh, uh, just to picking up, you know, that uh, we don't want to get left behind. You know, so much of the rest of the world is acting on net zero. So um, if we care about sort of inclusion, it really matters that, that we're there ahead of things. And the, the co-benefits, I think you mentioned, super important. That some of the things that you both are talking about, they just make sense with or without climate change. As I was saying, investment, you know, future-proof jobs. Um, reducing people's heating and, and cooling costs. Yeah, so they, they make sense either way, but there's more of an imperative now. So um, got, certainly got me thinking there. So now our next two speakers are, um, are two LSE speakers, and we'll start with uh, Liam. Great, and I'm so happy that you could come out today and that I could take part in such a really interesting panel. So Chris and Rain have done some fantastic work, both in their general work, but also today explaining a lot of the macro that's going on. So what I want to dive into more is really more at the micro, so at the individual level. Um, and you may ask to some extent, what is there to talk about, right? You constantly read in the media that so many people care about climate change. YouGov recently had a poll that said over two thirds of the UK population are concerned about climate change. So in some respects, the battle has been won in that regard, right? That this is an issue on the agenda. But as I want to get into, once we get more into the realities of what we actually do about this, the policies, the distributional implications, the costs and the benefits, then we start to see some of the challenges that may emerge from a public acceptance and a political feasibility perspective. So what I want to do is first kind of outline some of these challenges to kind of convince you that they exist. Um, then think about how policy can actually overcome these and how if we're mindful about policy, we can 
avoid some of these backlash issues that we've seen in many contexts in the world. And then third, even that if you have the best policy, communication, as noted before, is really key to get people on board and to realize the benefits that actually come about through the green transition. So climate policy and dealing with climate change has always had this fundamental challenge, fundamental issue, which is that the benefits we get very often from dealing with climate and mitigating CO2 emissions, reducing global temperatures, feel kind of diffuse and abstract and in the future, whereas the immediate costs are quite real and immediate, right? So if we look at, for example, the Climate Change Committee's six carbon budget, the kind of courses, the timeline of how costs and benefits look from a monetary perspective over the coming decades, it's only really in about 15 years' time that the benefits really start to outweigh the costs, right? So we have this initial cost that we have to invest to get a better long-run outcome. Uh, I don't need to tell you we're in a cost of living crisis right now, so this is very much on people's attention and can maybe kind of dissuade them from the short term when thinking, okay, given the challenges I'm facing right now, should we be spending money on this? But also the nature of the transition itself, if we're thinking about jobs and we're thinking about employment, there's also challenges that emerge there, right? So we've seen in certain polluting industries before about left behind communities where transitions were allowed to happen without the necessary support. Um, but also the nature of green jobs paints some kind of picture of where there may be challenges as well, right? So great work that's been done by the Granton Research Institute, but also Anna's work with the Resolution Foundation, very much notes that a lot of these green jobs are kind of more skilled, non-routine tasks, these kind of things that are associated with individuals' employment and occupational risk and affect those disproportionately with less skills and more automatable tasks. So in my own research, I looked in 23 European countries about individuals' kind of occupational risk from exactly these kind of technological changes. And maybe unsurprisingly, what you find is these are the kind of bedrock of those who are less concerned about climate change, feel less responsible for dealing with climate change, and are less supportive of climate policy. So how do we get these people on board? Right? How do we deal with the case that, okay, we need to engage in a transition, we need to engage in costs, to get a better future for everyone. So one key aspect here is really thinking about policy design and thinking about also policy packaging. So not just thinking of this in isolation, but how we combine various elements to increase public acceptance and political feasibility. So I want to illustrate this with one of the kind of hardest cases when it comes to policy in the area of climate policy, which is that of carbon taxes. So carbon taxes are very much loved by economists because they have the great feature of making people internalize the externality, incentivizing a change in behavior, and they're very economically efficient. But we've seen from the streets with the gilets jaunes and fuel taxes to the ballot box in Washington with ballot initiatives that they face a real hard challenge when it comes to political feasibility, right? So why is this the case? Again, upfront costs, not super clear benefits that are kind of being paid off in the but in my own research and kind of quite a bit of other research in this area, one of the ways to think about this is not to think of carbon taxes just in terms of the price, the cost, but what do they also bring with them? They bring money, they bring revenue, right? And the way you use this revenue is key for getting people on board. So one of the failures of the Gilets Jaunes movement was, okay, the government said that they would use the revenue, but what did they say that they would do with this? That they would reduce the deficit. Fairly unspecific, unclear benefit. Whereas if you move towards using the revenue, which is increasingly becoming the case for tax rebates, direct transfers to individuals, direct um, allocation to projects, these are the things that show people that there are clear benefits from this tax and will ultimately get them on board in the long run. And so we have to be very mindful, and I think Chris has done a great job with this idea of guardrails and really laying this out in the Net Zero report, of how we think about policy design as a broad, kind of sense, not just thinking about individual costs and benefits, but how we combine them together to generate a political coalition that will move forward with climate policy. But the third thing I want to add and to just kind of illustrate this is even with the best designed policy, if there's not the communication behind it, then you're going to run into challenges. And a lot of the issue around framing and communication of policies 
one thing that really needs to be made clear to individuals in order for them to get buy-in is a really concrete conception of what this means for them. And so while co-benefits for the economy as a whole, for health, exist, uh, my own research tends to find that these don't actually push people that much more forward in terms of public acceptance compared to the risks of climate change when they're stated in this very broad manner. Again, because it's very diffuse and it's very abstract. What is the actual benefit for me? But the more you make it concrete in terms of these are the savings that you can make, the more you put it in pounds and pence if you care about it from this material perspective, or the more you can demonstrate how it's affected air pollution locally for individuals, the more that there's something tangible and real, and the more that this outweighs any cost that comes about from the policy in the first place. And from my own experience, having lived in Switzerland for some time where they do directly give back the money, there was a period of time where I didn't even realize this because it was just a line item on my health insurance bill that I just kind of never really opened and checked. The key is, is that this needs to be upfront, clear, and immediate to people so that this is what's in mind when thinking about climate policy rather than, okay, fuel is this much more expensive, or carbon intensive fuels is this much expensive. So that should hopefully give you a sense of where I see the kind of challenges over the coming year. These economic challenges are real. They do need to be addressed. There are distributional consequences. But if we're very clear and mindful when it comes to policy design and linking these together and communicating these, then the challenges can be turned into opportunities. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Liam. And um, next is uh, Anna. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here. And going last, I have to say, I, I think what I'm going to say is definitely going to be complementary to what we've heard so far, and in some sense, bridging everything that we've heard with some macro points and some bottom-up points too. So this is the decisive decade for climate change, for dealing with climate change. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change all around us. And as has been noted by the IPCC, we're running out of time if we want to have any chance of limiting global warming within the 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. For the UK, as in other advanced economies, we know that delivering net zero commitments requires large-scale and system-wide change um, and investment accompanying that. So investment, additional annual capital investment will be rising to around 15, 50 billion um, additional investment per annum very quickly. And of course, this is against the backdrop of us underinvesting as a nation for some time, both in the public sector and the private sector. And much of this investment is expected to come from the private sector. So innovation and change are going to be massive. And particularly in terms of the scale of that investment, energy, the energy sector, decarbonizing our buildings and transport are kind of key areas of challenge. Um, so there are a number of challenges we've already heard. So in contrast to much of the decarbonization that has gone before, much of this will involve change that affects our lives much more directly and we'll feel it in work, at home, in terms of our lifestyles. Um, and as I said, this substantial investment is needed at a time when we actually really need to increase investment to address our very poor productivity performance and associated poor and stagnant living standards against this challenging cause of the environment, which is the cost of living crisis. Um, we're fiscally constrained, we have high interest rates. We've got increased trade barriers with our closest and largest trading partner, and increased competition through large-scale subsidies overseas, particularly in the US and in the EU. But there are massive opportunities, which if we delay, we will not capture. Plus, if we delay, the cost of the transition will be higher. It's clear that net zero investments are attractive investments. We've heard many reasons why. They have the potential to generate sustainable growth opportunities across the country based on where those investments need to be made. We've done a lot of analysis on that. They have the, the potential, and they are, increasing our resilience and security in energy and other supply chains, and of course, improve resource efficiency. So if we're more efficient, we use less energy, that's a cost saving for us, and the, the same applies for businesses. And importantly, we've heard about the co-benefits. You know, if we think about the improved health, and there are a number of mechanisms through which net zero change in investments will improve health, but a key one is this cleaner air co-benefit. We've heard about that already, but over 30,000 deaths per year attributed, are attributed to long-term exposure to air pollution, and much of this is due to fossil fuels. So innovation is central to the story, and we heard that you know, we've had previous waves of technical change or creative destruction where new technologies come in and replace the old technologies, we can see this as accelerating a period of creative destruction, 
But what differentiates this is that we need to give that creative destruction a direction somehow towards sustainability such that innovation and investments are consistent with sustainability aims. And then what di differentiates it is really this urgency because we know that we need a lot of this change very quickly. Um, so that's the kind of purpose of the creative destruction. Our work at the LSC and with Grantham Research Institute um, and also the Resolution Foundation has tried to shed light on where some of the clean tech or innovative strengths are in the UK, where we can actually be international competitive and where we might be able to generate some growth benefits as demand for such technologies is growing both in the UK and internationally. But then the other side of this creative destruction process is the destruction part where we've already heard we need to actively manage the uneven impacts of the transition. So think of displacement, disruption, costs, change which will be felt unevenly by firms, workers and households. So against the background of our large scale and persistent inequalities that we've seen in the UK, against the background of the cost of living crisis that makes that much more stark for many people, um, and given the fact that fundamentally, as we've again already heard, the choices that people are making as voters, as engaged citizens, as consumers, as workers, as investors, all of those choices are going to determine the success of the transition, whether we actually make it happen. So public support, communication, realizing the benefits in a fair way, sharing costs in a fair way is fundamentally important. So I wanted to just touch a bit more um, on kind of how net zero will affect these two groups of people, given the theme of people and change, so workers and households. And what we know of how net zero is likely to affect those groups and then what policy can do. Um, okay, with workers, we've already heard a bit about this, but as it stands, there are, there's no currently accepted or generally agreed definition of what a green job is, and there are different types of analysis that are useful depending on your exact question. So some of the work we've done um, has been trying to take an occupational approach. So you define occupations as being green or not green or green to some extent. And the nice thing about this kind of work is you can then work with labor force survey data. So you can look at actual people, you can look at the types of people who are holding these jobs compared to people, say, in non-green jobs or specifically jobs in, say, dirtier sectors that are higher emissions. And um, some of the analysis we've shown is particularly these jobs that are directly green or the ones that involve new green tasks and skills, mm -hmm. things like wind turbine engineers, but also things like a production manager that needs to consider sustainability now in their operations. These jobs in general have been considered good jobs in the sense that higher education, often we had more analytical skills, the types of things that are more resilient, automation perhaps. They're also quite well paid, even when you control for other attributes, such as education and other things. Um, so that's all very promising, but when we look at the types of people who've been holding such jobs to date, they tend to be more likely to be held by males, older workers, um, and potentially also white workers in the UK. So it's clear that we need to make sure that any opportunities arising in the transition are accessible more broadly to those people who need them. Um, at the aggregate level, most analyses consider that the net zero transition will be a net creator of jobs, and you often have to look sector by sector at the needs of different sectors to understand this, but a very recent review from the Climate Change Committee considers that you know, there could be between 135,000 and 725,000 new jobs, in the transition and depending on a number of things like what the labor market looks like in general and whether we capture some of those opportunities. By contrast, few workers are likely to completely lose their jobs. Around 1%, for example, are currently employed in coal, oil and gas. But of course, there's going to be local places, sectors, and we've heard this already, where this will be a particular issue. So you will need strong policies to try and address that displacement. Um, and it's very clear then that human capital, skills, retraining, these types of things are really important for dealing with the displacements, but also for ensuring that the transition can happen and we can deliver on all these things we need to do. So there's clearly a role for the education system, the pipeline of people coming into the labor market, making more clarity around what these new careers will look like. Are they, are they secure jobs? What happens when installation gives way to maintenance? What do the career paths look like? Um, on the job training for those already in work, this is an area where we do quite badly in the UK. Investment in firms in training the workforce has actually been falling for some time. Are there additional incentives that we need to encourage that? And then targeted programs, whether it's place specific, um, local stakeholders working together, education institutions, policy makers, um, businesses fundamentally working together. And there are some examples of sector-based training, for example, 
Quest San Antonio is a program that is often been well evaluated and is considered successful as a general sector-based training program. The Ruhr Valley in Germany, an area that has successfully made a transition away from coal, for example. Um, and of course, we can learn from some of the current things happening in the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, where there are these general tax incentives to encourage clean investments, but these are added to with various bonuses if you have an apprenticeship as part of the jobs you're offering, or if you offer a good wage. So it's looking at the good job angle, or if you're creating a job in a particular place, deprived community or other kind of key objectives that you want to make sure that you're focusing on providing support for. But more broadly, you really need the stability and long-term policy commitments. And you know, this was very much emphasized in the Net Zero Review, which we're very happy to contribute to to encourage businesses to understand this is the direction of travel, to encourage businesses if they know, for example, there's a regulated phase out date or a phase in date for a certain technology, that gives them the incentive to make sure the skills are in place and it gives the workers much more certainty on, on kind of the demand for a certain set of skills. Um, so just moving on to households briefly, um, this really is a key challenge for the UK. You know, we've already discussed, we have particularly energy efficient homes because we have quite a large older kind of housing stock. And this is part of the reason we're particularly exposed to the, to the energy shock that we've just been through. So, of course, there are a number of benefits, the, the cost savings, the health. So if you have less energy efficient homes, then in the winter, you're less likely to feel the cold. This, this is very important. Indoor air pollution from gas cooking, etc. So if we can move away from those things, that's all very good. There are the financial costs. It can be very hard for some to cover particularly in a cost of living crisis, but there are non-financial costs too. It's very disruptive to get people in your house to deal with energy efficiency. There's a lot of uncertainty around the applicability of heat pumps, different types of property. There are concerns about the lack of accredited tradespeople who you can trust the quality of their work. So you really need this holistic approach with the demand side incentives, but also making sure on the supply side that the skills, the infrastructure, say on electric vehicles, making sure the infrastructure is there for charging, you need a holistic approach to these different changes that we need to do. So it's really important that the transition for households is fair and perceived to be so, and that's where the communication really comes in. Distributional analyses of the groups likely to find things difficult. You know, this is something Resolution Foundation have done a lot in some of our joint work on Net Zero, looking at some of the changes for households. And I think the ULES expansion currently kind of reveals some of the issues. I mean, this is, this is primarily a policy about cleaning up London's air, but of course it has massive net zero motivations and benefits too. But it's clear that certain small businesses, certain carers or other people will find some of the transition at the pace that is required hard, and recently the mayor has extended some of the support. But this is also an area where you start to see rumblings of disagreement and people saying the air where we live isn't dirty, you know, why do we have to make this transition? And so actually making some of the benefits more tangible to people, people really understanding how actually cleaner air is good for all of us, good for our children, good for our communities. And I think that's not always, at least in a coordinated fashion, public information campaigns on things like net zero and co-benefits haven't been that clearly communicated across society. So in conclusion, net zero represents a significant opportunity for the UK and for the world to move to a more attractive, sustainable and inclusive growth path. But policy is so fundamental to all of this due to the market failures, due to the challenges. So we really need strong, coordinated and well communicated policies to ensure that we move fast enough, seize those opportunities and have a successful transition. Thanks so much. Maybe a round of applause for all our speakers. <laughs> really helpful to go from the sort of the, the government and the business sector down to, to sort of you know drilling right down which is so we know change has to happen and we don't want to be left behind but you know there are individuals who are going to be asking will I have a job and there's other individuals who are going to ask be asking can I pay my bills when those much economists love taxes are stuck on everything it would seem and, um, and and you know these are real concerns, and so it's you know it's 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 um it's not easy as reality bites that as we do this. So there are no simple solutions, even if most of the people in the UK want want to see this. I think, and so I, I I thought this was really brilliant to really lay out why it's difficult, what needs to be done, and what opportunities there are. It's not easy, and how do we do it best? And I think interesting. There's a big role for government, big role of industry working together in terms of you know those industrial policies, trainings, and skills we need. 
Um, to, uh, but understanding that change always happens and we need to manage it well because we haven't always managed it well in the past. So with that, um, we're going to open up for questions. While you think of your questions, I think we're going to go to some... Uh, do we have some online questions? Well, we've got a couple. Okay, do you, do you want to give those online questions and then I'll ask the panel um, to, uh, to keep their answers brief because I, I love our hearing the panel, but I also like hearing the questions and comments. So we'll try and have a good balance of both because we we've, we've got a good 15 minutes, which is fantastic. Okay, the first question is from Virag Rahan uh, Dyer from Mumbai, India. He asks uh, about uh, developing nations and how we can encourage them to shift to green energy when a large proportion of their industry is more dependent on fossil fuels. And One second. Um, <laughs> And we've also got a question from Billy Davis asking uh, how much you agree that uh, subsidies should be focusing on retrofitting rather than building new infrastructure, um, pointing out that things like the gas, green gas support screen um, is excluded, um, excludes the water sector, uh, where they could be responsible for contributing two thirds uh, of the gas grid decarbonisation targets. Fantastic. So one question um, asks us to remember low and middle income countries, most of the global population, um, underserved by energy to start with. Um, how are they, where are they going to find their energy from? And another question on where should subsidies be targeted? So um, who's, who's going to pick up and start the answers? Why don't I, I said Anna, it's Rain, Rain. Rain. <laughs> don't you love that? I confuse everyone, Rain. I'm happy to go, though. I, I, I'm uh, go first. I'm sure my fellow panelists will, will have thoughts. I mean, look, the it, it is just that this has to be a, a, a transition, a just transition across the whole globe, and and can, you know, and, and obviously the the communities that are most affected by climate change are are in developing countries, and and I think it's just some of the challenges we have seen here in the past year around thinking about energy security. The, the cost of energy are even more uh, acute in, in developing countries, right? We have to make sure that in this transition that that uh, people have access to, to energy. But, you know, at the same time, it's about getting that, that scale of in, investment and uh, that, you know, and, and obviously that investment into renewable energy. And there is the opportunity for some countries to leapfrog some of the technologies and, and uh, not have some of the challenges that we face ar around retrofitting, uh, for example. But it, you know, it, it, and we saw, and I'm sure uh, Chris and others may speak to this as, as well. I think in in uh, COP26 and in, in COP since then, we've seen some commitments in terms of uh, funding available for developing countries to make the transition. But it's only going to happen with the public sector, but also private sector in investment and. Uh, but I think that point about how we help countries transition is, is really important. Mm -hmm. This is about the transition within countries, but it's mm -hmm. absolutely about mm -hmm. uh, between countries as well. Uh, on the second question, I wasn't sure I, I understood the full complexity of the question in, in terms of the water industry. I suppose when we're thinking about subsidies more generally, what I can say <laughs> is I think at the moment how the business community in the UK is feeling, we, we've seen the US have... Uh, pursue the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, is obviously the US have, have been put, you know, really large scale subsidies into some green technologies. And it was good to see uh, some of the commitment we had from their prime minister uh, around the, the deal with the US to think about how can the UK benefit uh, from uh, be part of some of the important supply chains around electric vehicles and, and more broadly. Uh, and obviously the EU have pursued the, the green um, the Green New Deal. So look, the UK probably can't outcompete in the overall scale of, of subsidies, but what we can do is set the right policy frameworks which help to unlock some of that private sector investment. We've seen so many businesses are willing uh, to get behind, but you need to, whether it's thinking about homes and that gap in the middle, uh, to make sure that we retrofitting, for example, or, or uh, air source heat pumps, that those are available to, to people who aren't necessarily either at the bottom end or the top end, that we make that economic uh, for individuals, you need to have an element of, of co-subsidies. So it, it's partly about how we provide the mechanisms of, of co-funding models across different technologies to help in the uh, transition and unlock some of the 
uh, private sector investment. Uh, just to add to that, on the point of energy efficiency, it's not just about the tax credits and the investment, vital though that is. Uh, it's about having that long-term programmatic certainty. You know, the 45Q tax credit is part of the Inflation Reduction Act. It's guaranteed to 1st January 2033. But Germany have already had their KFW mm -hmm. energy installation program that's guaranteed for at least 10 years. And you speak to business and industry, and you know, the government comes up with these three-year green homes grant projects that sort of begin to you know, catalyze the industry, then it all collapses. And we've got to go away from this project-by-project project approach if we want to sort of actually deliver that's the only way to get costs down, is actually mm. sort of setting out and coming in behind what needs to happen. Though I would agree with Billy, you know, water energy efficiency you know, is a poor relation when it comes to air energy efficiency. And that's why having a strategic approach that takes everything into account and looking at the entirety of the building rather than just taking one area piecemeal also needs to happen. At the moment, we've got this approach, which is sort of like, look at the transition, so the scattergun approach of helping various different sectors, often those sectors that lobby politicians most effectively, we need actually to work backwards. We need to sort of say, where do we want to be? What's the outcome we need by 2030, 2035, 2050? And how are we going to plan though? And also how are we going to plan for the unknowable events where things maybe don't go to plan so that we can have that ability to de-risk some of those trajectories. And then just on the international question, obviously we've got the Just Energy Transition Partnerships in Vietnam, Indonesia, South Africa. That was another key outcome of COP. 26. And obviously, I think the key here is to focus on sectors, focus on coal, focus on steel, focus on areas where those countries can have ownership also of delivering on the global challenges. Because if we can demonstrate to them, it's not just being done to them by sort of, you know, the sort of global north, they are actually the countries which are pushing forwards on showing what can happen. That's really key. And I do, I have a concern also with certain countries that are looking at areas like green hydrogen's opportunity. So you mentioned Elizabeth, they want they need their energy themselves. They don't need that energy stolen from them by other wealthy countries that are looking to potentially take their import their green hydrogen. So there's a tension between that economic growth in the global south and making sure again that we don't just have some kind of new green colonialism where the global south takes the energy that's needed from the global south. I'm going to open up some questions from the audience, but you can always tack on some um, answers. So um, we've got a we've got a few hands up. So I can certainly see. Two, we've got one here in the white t-shirt and one at the back. We'll start with white t-shirt, one in the greenish blue polo. Don't know what color that is. Um, and is there a third question anywhere? And a third question there. So we'll start with those three questions. Hi, I'm Catherine from PLMR, uh, representing Bluefield Solar Income, the University of Sheffield and others. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit more if you could expand on the role that educators um, have, um, particularly thinking of HE, FE, institutions and schools. Thank you. Thank you. So first question and then a second question at the back. Um, oh, do you not have a you, mic yet? You hear me like that. I don't have a <laughs> oh. oh, maybe there's only one roving mic, sorry. Uh, so my question is about big roles and, and so how realistic is it given that we are also expecting people to change their consumption and using consumption means smaller market. Also, and, uh, in addition, there are limited resources. So why for renewable energy, there is like uh, an infinite source like sun, but like, extracting it needs minerals and steel and resources that uh, scientists have a lot of research on how limited they are and giving the uh, reserves out there. Also would be a limit to how much energy would be uh, there. So how can we communicate the growth? Thank you, that's great. And then I think that was our third question there. And then we'll um, start some answers. So I have, have you guys running around. Do you want to just put your, do you know where you're going to? Can you just, yep. Yeah. Thank you, I'm Annabelle Ross, a master's student here studying the psychology of economic life and a sustainable finance, transition finance researcher at the Grantham Research Institute. My question is maybe a helpful wrap up. Um, for each of four of you, um, what one thing related to seizing opportunities and managing change would you stop, start, and continue in the pithiest answers you can give? They're going to have to be pithy. We've got six minutes. Role of educators, degrowth, how realistic, and one thing. So should I start with um, uh, Anna and um, Liam, and then all of you very quick fire shot. Remember, all of you have got to give your answers in the next six minutes. Okay, so um, on education, I think that's fundamental for growth in general and for sustainable growth and delivering net zero too. 
given that we know there are all these new skills that are going to, going to come up um, and where there are a number of pre-existing gaps. So HE is obviously fundamental for the engineers, for the really high-end skills, um, for the general skills, for the analytical skills, managerial skills, all of those things. And FE is fundamental in complement with that, but particularly some of the technical skills where we also know that there are long-standing gaps. And of course, there's the role for national policy, setting the curriculum, the paths, which apprenticeships, for example, which courses are valid for different um, professions, and a lot of, there's a lot of activity in that space, but also this role of the national, uh, sorry, the regional collaboration between different stakeholders to understand the specific challenges in specific places. On degrowth, we've had a number of um, debates here at the LSE about this, and our colleagues more broadly. Um, I mean, I think that the issue with degrowth is, while you might be able to justify this vision um, morally that maybe we can all do with less, given the urgency of the climate crisis, given the fact that degrowth would require quite a wholesale change in the way we organize all of our society and economies, it seems like using the growth motivation, innovation-led growth, clean growth as a motivation for this investment is a much more practical and attractive way forward for now. Um, in terms of what we would stop, start, and continue, I would stop confusing policies and messages. I would stop investing in fossil fuels um, and ensure that we are, the direction of our policies all point in the same direction. You know, one thing is we had this run up to a green day at the end of March and that was changed to energy security day. I think even those changes, they, they create a different message. Um, in terms of start, you know, I think we're expecting a more of a res response from government on how we as the UK respond to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I think we do need a proper growth strategy for the UK, and I think net zero is a part of that. It's not the only part of it. We need to recognise all the other things like services that we're really good at, and they're not high emission sectors. In terms of continue, I think we need to allow policies some time to actually bed in and not have the constant chopping and changing, and that's within the same party being um, in government, but also we have a general election coming up. So I would hope that net zero policies and the things we need to be in place can continue. We got a minute each, but Liam, you can take slightly more. Okay. Um, yeah. So many different topics. Um, so I mean, education obviously is important from the skill side. Um, I think also in general, right? If we think about communication, I was kind of talking about this from a top-down perspective. But the more that people actually understand the basics of the issue and this, there's kind of communication within communities and within families and this, which helps diffuse come kind of some of these ideas and some of these ways of thinking a lot more than very often direct top-level down communication actually does. Um, degrowth. So, so it's a very interesting discussion around this, and particularly if we're thinking about this uh, very often from the developing economy perspective and these kind of competing tensions between the fact that many, many people are in severely materially bad situations. And so the demand to improve the economy, uh, but the potential environmental hazards with this, my always flippant answer with degrowth is that a lot of the political battle is lost by having to explain what advocates of degrowth mean rather than degrowth. Because for people who are on lower incomes, the idea that their incomes would not grow is politically toxic. And so reframing it more in terms of the issues that I think are rightly raised in terms of you know, planetary boundaries, right, or kind of just transitions in this has a lot more bite and a lot more efficacy uh, and is an important to consider. I, I might have to move on to Rain and Chris because yeah. we've got a really hard stop, I believe, okay. haven't we? Right, uh, super quick. So uh, I think around schools, I just encourage everyone to, uh, as students get involved in London Climate Action Week, there's some brilliant stuff that they do in terms of outreach to schools. So uh, there's so much that we can do around that. In terms of stop, start, continue, I would say, uh, stop building homes that we know in future will need to retrofit. So that's about bringing forward some of the uh, regulation around the built environment to, to make sure that we are building net zero homes, but we need to have a level playing field on that. I would start uh, thinking about biodiversity at the same time as climate in everything that we do. Uh, the UK is starting uh, some of that thinking with net biodiversity gain, but that's on all of us uh, in everything that we do. Third, uh, continuous is thinking about net zero in policies as we develop them across government. We've seen, we've seen some really good progress on that. There's so much more uh, we can do. Thank you. Chris. Okay, so I'd start 129 recommendations of the 10 10 year missions <laughs> in my mission zero review. Uh, if we want to achieve net zero, I would stop issuing new oil and gas licenses uh, in the North Sea because we lose the ability to influence global 
policy if we don't take action ourselves. Uh, and finally, I'd continue to the work of the Climate Change Act and our carbon budget process and the Committee on Climate Change, which is genuinely world leading and is already making a difference in setting out what we need to do to achieve the pathways on net zero. And that is slow for your start. Stop. Continue. A combination of all three. <laughs> so more policy consistency and long term vision. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you so much to our speakers um, for a really fascinating discussion. Thank you for the people who posed these brilliant questions. We always want more time to answer the questions. I hate being the chair because I have to stop people and not ask the questions we want, which is such a shame. But I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. There's lots of exciting events coming on with the week. And if you go downstairs, there's an exhibition which you can enjoy also. So um, can we just once again just thank our speakers so much? <laughs> engaging this there couldn't be a more important topic I think so um thank you for engaging